Hello Fiasco is a Canadian-American pop rock band that arrived on the scene in 2021. Four of the members reside north of the border in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, while lead singer and frontman Eric Labossier is Southside in Helena, Montana, USA, making Hello Fiasco a truly North American band. It's exciting to be here today on August 4th, 2023, precisely one year to the day that Find the Shoreline, their debut album, was released. The album has now reached over 5 million streams with in excess of 2 million unique viewers. The lead-off singles Hold Me Close and Gorgeous Girl have combined for over 2 million of those streams. Songs from the album have now received over 40,000 trackable radio plays in 40 countries. Hello Fiasco is on the rise, indicated by several top 30s and number ones on the U.S. college chart. So today we talk to the band and co-producer John Paul Peters. Eric Labossier, lead singer, guitarist, frontman. Joel Couture, or Joe Koo, on bass. Joel Perot, Joe P, lead guitar, backing vocals. Guy Abraham, keyboards, Ableton, backing vocalist, and John Paul Peters, co-producer. Welcome, Hello Fiasco. Let's dive right into the music with leader Eric. The album is Find the Shoreline, the band is Hello Fiasco. Where does the band name come from? It's a clever play on words. The, the band name comes from wanting to have a band name that embraces change because when we were forming Hello Fiasco out of um, the Mailman's Children, we went through a lot of challenges and and figuring out a couple of new players and recording and producing and all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of changes going on. And so we wanted a band name that embraced change and welcome it, kind of like the uh, buffalo that decides to run into the storm headlong versus the cow that runs away and drags out the agony of the storm. So Hello Fiasco comes from embracing change and welcoming it and uh, getting into the fiasco. Well, we're going to get right back to that right after we say, okay, so we know where the band comes from, but find the shoreline. Uh, the first thing people are going to think about is you can't get any further than Helena, Montana and Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba than a shoreline, although we have a lot of lakes. Tell us about the title. Right, yeah, so it's pretty obvious that we're a bunch of prairie and Midwest kids if you look at the U.S. and Canada. Um, but even though we grew up there, the Find the Shoreline title comes from the, the, the metaphor or the story of being lost at sea for a while. And so, again, our band went through a lot of challenges to get together and then to start producing uh, our first record in a, in a way that made us proud of the future and get us more commercial success. And so it, it was all about being lost for a while at sea and trying to find our way there. And we think that with this record, we've really made a mark and uh, we're, we've, we think that we found the first shoreline, even though there's a lot more shorelines to come. No longer treading, you're That's swimming. Right. Which, which that brings us to Hello Fiasco being born out of the retooling of the first band, The Mailman's Children. Tell us, tell us more about that transformation and who is involved because there are some members from both projects. Uh, and your co-producer, John Paul Peters, JP, has been involved in both. Right, so Joe and Joe here, um, I've played with for quite a few years. We, we did four records together as the Mailman's Children, which John Paul Peters uh, did the last two records for us, studio re releases. And uh, at the end of the Mailman's Children um, in 2015, we had recorded that last effort in 2013. So there was a, there was a gap of a few years where um, I was going through some, all of us were playing with different projects and doing different things. I was focusing on songwriting and we were all going through different things in music. But if we looked at the Mailman's Children, we were a little bit more prog and a little bit more uh, having longer songs, maybe not as commercial. And so we wanted to change that. And that's why with Hello Fiasco, uh, we decided to get songs down to three minutes. We decided to actually listen to listeners and what they wanted as well, meaning we still write music that we love. But part of that process, what happened was John Paul Peters, who we had worked with previously on our last two Mailman's Children records, he joined up with us on a higher level in terms of producing and songwriting. He actually came down to Montana to spend some time with me on songwriting for the base of the songs. And then when we got back in the studio, we added Guy Abraham, um, who's an exceptional singer and adds a new dynamic to the band with keys and pianos and sounds. So if you look at all that happening, that's how the transformation occurred. We started with three Mailman's Children members, plus a producer that already knew where we were and knew where we wanted to go, and we, uh, we made the change. So, recorded 23 songs over five years. Wow. 
And uh, Joe Koo, we have to ask you, you've, you've played with Eric in both projects and known each other for years. And Hello Fiasco has gained some serious, significant traction that Mailman's Children didn't, whether it be streaming, radio, press. Uh, what's been the change? What's the difference, business and creative-wise? Uh, you, know, you know, part of that is people are thinking, well, to go from a narrative rush-like song to three-minute pop songs, <laughs> is that a radical change or...? Tell us about this transformation from your perspective. Regarding the industry, I think it's something we better understand. I think with uh, with TMC, you've got you know young young adults experimenting with with different musical I don't know, ideas, and, and perhaps perhaps there was a little less of a business focus. Of course, we also managed uh, TMC ourselves, um, but I think the shift, I think the the experience we gained uh, individually and as artists and producers, and I think we were in a situation where we better understood what needed to be done to perhaps reach that next level. Does experience take the fear out of the business side? Because that is the elephant in the room, so to speak, for many uh, aspiring or starting out performers. Yeah, definitely. Joe and I, Joe and I manage the band together currently, um, even though we work with all kinds of different parties. And because of doing it for quite a while, and also reading up a lot, going to a lot of industry events, Joe works in the industry. Um, we've learned so much that we feel much more confident. Even though every day we know there's so much more to learn, running what we're doing and getting success is becoming a lot easier after years of trials and tribulations. I think some of that confidence also comes from. You know the, the relationships we've, you know, nurtured over all these years, um, and those relationships and experiences have taken us here now to better understand, you know, the, the 360 of it all, the business, the music, where to, you know, where to, where to take it, what to do with it. So, it's been interesting. Well, let's get to, to, to more of the creative stuff. Uh, Joe P. Hey. Uh, we we all know the guitarists love to play. And they make great sounds. Uh, you're now you've gone from the narrative down, you know, a longer narrative and more uh, technical music to a th uh, three minute concise pop rock song that gets in and out. Uh, do you find that those parameters limiting or freeing? How's how's the process changed? Because it's not different people. You haven't radically flipped or right. sold out as people like to use these days. It's a different side of the band. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, I think there's the, the parameters are, are both limiting and freeing. From, from our early days where it was more riff-based music, um, for, from the guitarist perspective, it, it's, it's one where you can write longer ideas, longer musical ideas. Um, nowadays, especially with our more pop-driven songs, the guitar's place has become more in the elements of the hook in the song, sometimes textures too as well, but um, it's just, it comes from a place where you have to be more concise and more uh, thoughtful about where you want to take up space, you know? Uh, the, the pop music in general um, lives in a space where ideas are brief and, and they, they they catch your attention and, and the guitar takes it takes up little spaces in the in those that concept if you will and in addition to changing the sound you've added some members in particular Guy Abraham you do your backing vocalist Keys and Ableton before we get to you tell the folks what is an Ableton <laughs> <laughs> good question actually um, how we use uh, what is known as Ableton is in a more live uh, performance aspect where we get to blend um, elements of our live performances, whether it's audio, MIDI uh, being performed uh, with previously recorded things that we, we can manipulate. It's an electronic device, right? Basically, yeah. yeah. It's basically a DAW, yeah, for, for those who know what a digital audio workstation is. Computer. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. So we, uh, we use that to you know sort of uh, help round out the sound and uh, achieve the sonics that we're going for. And it's done live, of course, right? 
Yes, yeah, p part is, and parts uh, that we can't necessarily reproduce live, you know, um, but for the most part, yes, it's all, uh, it's all triggered live and ready to go. And, and we keep calling you the, the backing vocalist, but your voice is all over the, f the, the first album. Uh, you're used to singing lead, having a band, or as well as being one of the most sought after voices in, in the local music scene. How is it different with Hello Fiasco being, you know, running with the pack rather than leading the pack? Well, for me, um, what it really all boils down to, whether, um, you know, le like you said, leading the pack or, you know, following the pack or being a part of the pack, uh, for me, it's all about, um, first and foremost, singing, you know? So, um, however I get to express myself or be able to add to a song or, or compliment others, that's really my main focus, you know, how I get to be creative using, you know, my, my vocal talents. Uh, so when it comes to working with these guys uh, and, and John Paul, uh, they really tend to, to push me in, in different directions. And I get to try out a lot of crazy stuff in the studio that doesn't always make it to the record, but um, it's a really great uh, venue for me to be able to, you know, explore you know, songs in that capacity and, and help the songs, you know. With all the opportunities that you have coming your way, what is it about Hello Fiasco that you said, I have to dive into this project? Well, uh, at first, um, they had asked me to sing on a couple songs, and then uh, that sort of multiplied over time uh, pretty quickly. And so what led me to want to uh, join the band in the end um, was that I really enjoyed the songwriting and the process and being in the studio and the, really the, the work environments that uh, they've, they've obviously like cultivated over the years. And, uh, you know, and we work with a couple, you know, so many great minds, you know, why not try to be a part of that? Joku and, and Eric smirking and looking at each other, that begs the question. <laughs> you've, got, you, you've got the vision. What tweak did you say, like, our vision must include Guy Abraham? Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to jump in and say, I think Guy is like a big engine in a beautiful car. Like, the car doesn't exist without the engine, and, but the engine doesn't always need to be seen. So I'm just thinking, like, you're a fantastic front vocalist, but also it's just like that tool that builds the whole. I think that's what, that's what is really special about your band uh, kind of overall, is that, is that it's not, yeah, you run, run Ableton and sing a few lines live, but you can do so much, you know, whenever it's needed, and, and that just makes it super special. There's, there's my feels, feels moment. Totally. <laughs> JP was a really big, <laughs> John Paul was a really big part of um, getting Guy into the band. We were, we were tracking in uh, early, the early songs for what became Find the Shoreline, and I remember in 2017, uh, we had already had a bunch of songs with Guy on it, and then one day JP and I looked at each other, and JP was like, you thinking what I'm thinking? I'm like, yes, he needs to be in the band. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally how it happened. So we, I think Guy knew what we were up to, but you know, we, one day we finally asked him, and that was the deal. So he adds so much to us. And what does JP add? Because, like you say, you've you you the band has a set vision. You're focused, and you've been the majority of the band has been together in Mailman's Children, and you've got you're this cohesive. Going back to the Buffalo, you're this cohesive Buffalo herd running into the challenge. You, you've worked with JP before, but a lot of times when people want to mix things up, whether it be the Tragically Hip or Brian Adams, there's, if there's a change in sound, there's a change in producers just because that was then, this is now. But, he's a, but not only have you in, incorporated him, he's co-producer and had some direct input into the songs. You're working with him. Rave him up. Absolutely. Yeah, so Hello Fiasco exists because of John Paul Peters. Uh, in 2015, I was walking up a mountain, and I was in a in a up and down kind of state about where the mailman's children was out, and I didn't know what I what I wanted to have happen. And JP said, "You need to man up," because I was going to go in and record some acoustic songs. <laughs> and he said, "You need to man up and <clears throat> find what's the good part of the mailman's children and get back, and then we'll come back in and do these three minute pop songs." but let's just leave these other songs on the side that you're going to do alone. You need to be with Joe and Joe. And so then after that, when JP and I 
um, looked at what was going to happen, we were going to go and record, it was no longer um, Eric making decisions or Eric and Joe making decisions. It was us making decisions with JP on everything. So whether it's songwriting uh, and JP helping us with the bed of the song, whether it's listening to demos at one in the morning when we send them and annoy the hell out of them, whether it's... Uh, him engineering the tracks. He does we do he does start to finish process, whereas other producers don't do that. He literally engineers us, he produces us with us, uh, works with us on the production, the songwriting, and then he does everything from mixing and first masters and the whole deal. So JP is our sixth member, is what we is what we uh, call him because he really is. He even joins us on stage sometimes. I think the term of production, it's it's very broad, right? Sometimes production can be just, you know, really in the engineering realm, and then sometimes it, it involves, like, being given a more of a creative license. And I think, I mean, I love working with the band and with Eric because um, on this last record, you know, they've given me that license to participate as a more in, an invitational participation, I suppose. And uh, I, I do all different kinds of roles with, other artists, I you know sometimes a lot more behind the scenes and sometimes less involved. And and uh, I, I love being right in there, um, in the thick of seeing the song, you know, get developed and get arranged. And and uh, you know I like poking the bears, you know, and and pushing them to to crank up the distortion and let the you know let the guitar scream occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So an, an interesting part of the, the process was you pulled fans on the songs before adding them to the album. As you mentioned, you had 23 songs prepared for the album. Uh, of course, not all of them made it. You vetted them to some uh, of your favorite fans, uh, just like Bon Jovi did. They went to the high school, played the songs for the kids, and their input directly affected the album. Just like uh, Find the Shoreline, you went straight to the fans and got their input. How did that work? How was the process? Uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, so we, um, one of the things that happened in 2015 was that we wanted to make it, we wanted to make a major change and not just be about us. And uh, unfortunately, when we're younger, sometimes it hits if you're, if you're making songs just about what we want and just we want to hear, and that sometimes works, but it doesn't work very often. And so we wanted to make a change where we met listeners in the middle, a 50-50 rule, 50% for us and what we love to write, 50% for the listener. And so there was this great company in, in uh, Europe called Sound Out, which has recently been bought by the Americans, and they have a polling service that surveys thousands of people. So we started um, testing our music with, with thousands of people in six different countries. And then we also, all of our circles of friends, like 100 people, we pulled with them, which they were pretty freaked out that we're actually giving them music before we release it and letting them have a vote on what we do. And they like it, or the people that we pull like it, and um, we learn the most about the song from the people in the crowd and from the people that listen to our music, I think. And so that's a major change that we've, uh, that we've made, that we're okay with people hearing it before and telling us we don't, we just, you know, we're not for that, or we're for that. Before I forget, I want to get to the crux of the band. They make movies about long distance relationships because it's so rare that they work out or people even contemplate them. Eric's 14 hours and 900 miles away, uh, but everybody has got this resolve for the band. How, how is it working? What are the challenges? Are there any perks? Bruce, that's the secret, being 14 hours <laughs> apart. <laughs> they enjoy me a lot more, Bruce. <laughs> I think I'll answer this first, but I think because there's because of our our history, our background, the loyalty within all of the band, I think we're at a point where we've established that strong foundation. And whether or not it's because of the you know the global pandemic, we we also pivoted with with our new realities, and and truthfully, it probably helped. I don't know. We were already used to maybe working long distance or uh, or finding new solutions. So I think we found a way, I think we have to find those solutions as, you know, five, six, seven busy people working in this industry. There's no choice but to be ready to pivot or find new solutions to get to where, you know, that buffalo is going. So the new technology today must be a godsend. 
You can now send large files. How much is, is the dedication and how much of it is technology? You can be as dedicated as you want, but if you can't share music, it's just not going to happen. How much is dedication? How much is technology? I think Eric just loves to drive. Yeah. You know? Hmm. It's, not, it's not far for him. You know, when we drive down there, it's 17 <laughs> hours with my kids in tow, right? <laughs> yeah, I think Guy uh, does a great job of bridging the gap in our band uh, by email and keeping us together. So we, I'll write a lot of voice memos late in the night that sound horrible, and I'll send them over to Guy, and then he'll put them on a grid and to click and send them to the guys. So technology really helps us, but Guy is the, the, uh, the, the event that happens in between. <laughs> He's the one who makes sure it actually happens so that we're all together. He's like, hey, guys, look at this email. It's a track that we're working on. And um, the guys are all dedicated once they get that song, and they, they all work on them. Obviously, but the biggest thing is technology saved us, uh, especially during COVID when we recorded in two different countries. It, the last song for the record, Before Time Leaves You, was recorded in Helena, Montana, and over here, and we couldn't have done that without technology of, of today, right? So it plays a big part of it. But to work on that one, when we were working on the actual song here at the studio, uh, when Eric couldn't make it because of the, the border closures, but we would, you know, we would have him online with... Uh, either like listen to software, there's different kinds of software that can, you know, Zoom, whatever. So we can get video, we can jump in on the song and hang out while we're tracking it. Like you were probably driving your car or doing work or whatever, you know, and uh, could still be present in a way that we totally couldn't have done probably even six, seven years ago. So I think of the pandemic, I don't know how we would have survived without the old internet. Millions of streaming fans can't be wrong. They're, they're hoping for a long friendship and a long career for the band. Eric Labossier, uh, Joel Couture, Joe Perot, Guy Abraham, John Paul Peters, thanks for taking time out of recording to join us today. And thank you for tuning in and supporting independent music. Until we meet again, be good, have fun, stay motivated. <laughs>